What's your minimum specification? Now, one of the items that interests me most about this tech space that we cover is brand new CPUs or brand new accelerators. Anything that's high performance that has the potential to come to a mass market. We're talking decent microarchitecture on good process nodes coming out of obscure situations. Now, x86 is dominated by Intel and AMD. We've also got Via and Centaur and sub licenses with Shaoxin. We've got that funny Hygon thing that existed. In the ARM space, there is uh, Ampere with their uh, new Ultra CPUs coming. Um, we've got Graviton 2, we had Qualcomm's Falcor, we've got Huawei's Kampeng. These all really excite me. So, cue my surprise to learn that Russia is working on a CPU as well. In fact, they've been working on a CPU for almost a decade, and there has been quite a few. Now, these are collectively known as Elbrus CPUs made by MCST. That's MCST, that uh, funny uh, U thing, um, because I can't read Cyrillic and my wife is learning Russian. These are collectively known as Elbrus CPUs, uh, made from the Moscow Center for Spark Technologies. Um, so the original ones for these were loosely built on Spark, um, contain a single core, and this week we learned that a, um, that a new 8-core processor, the Elbrus 8C, now has a programming guide online for people to read and use, and actually has some microarchitectural information. Now, these latest Elbrus uh, CPUs, these eight cores, as you can see, can go into a quad socket form factor um, with in interconnectivity. And the goal of these CPUs, like um, any state funded type of CPU development, whether that's China creating its own CPUs or in this case, Russia, um, the goal is to build silicon. So every part of that silicon is known. These countries want to reduce their reliance on the Intels and AMDs of the world um, because they are primarily um, designed in the US and uh, manufactured in a variety of places around the world. Uh, what they don't want is a situation where they're importing the high performance x86 chips and they have potential backdoors involved. Now, this gives Russia or China or whoever else wants to do this, um, even in Europe, the ability to perhaps implement their own backdoors or their own cryptographic algorithms that are more focused towards what they want as compute. Now, these government CPUs typically vary in how well accessed they are from the populace. Uh, some will purely be, you know, for research purposes or for supercomputer purposes, uh, as we've seen in China. Um, or they may filter down into government machines and in a way they can also implement different variations of uh, monitoring what goes on on those processes. Basically, if you control the silicon and the software stack, you control everything. And the case is if you buy an Intel CPU or an AMD C CPU, you don't control the silicon. So this is true vertical integration um, at a uh, country level. Now, this is the document that came online, um, the effective, Guide to Effective Programming on the Elbrus platform. Uh, this is actually in Russian, so this is a, a nice Google translation. And uh, it's, it's a pretty thorough document, actually. Uh, it goes into working with the platform, um, how to write code. Uh, there are specific compilers for this. Um, I'll go into a presentation later that shows that this actually runs x86 code through machine translation. Um, that may put some of you off, um, but they're promising up to 80% performance um, or a minimum of 80% performance. Uh, we'll go into the slides there. Um, now, this is uh, an important section, introduction to the Elbrus architecture. And this will go through, you know, the fact that it's a VLIW type, a very long instruction word type um, architecture that goes to 512 bits. And then we have examples of uh, you know, improving performance of code, um, optimized libraries and optimized programs, memory model. Um, these are all things that if you regularly program for x86 and ARM architecture types, um, this is what you'll see in uh, the optimization guides. And this is a custom 
Elbrus E2K micro architecture, um, but as I said, with x86 translation on top. So this is the main document I found relating to these processors. Uh, Russian microprocessors of the Elbrus architecture series for servers and supercomputers. Uh, this is presented at Russian Supercomputing Days 2015. So this is going on a fair bit. Um, some of this will be very relevant. Some of this perhaps will have changed in the last five years. Unfortunately, they don't tend to present this information at any of the conferences that I go to. So, you know, cue my surprise that I hear that there's a programming guide and microarchitecture discussion about the new 8-core CPU. But Elbrus or MCST, uh, they, you know, design CPUs, they design south bridges, and as a result, these go into um, these go into uh, systems and servers, and it runs Linux and binary compatibility with Intel and uh, secure program execution technology because yeah, these have to be secure enough for the Russian government. Um, and this presentation is uh, quite quite good actually. Um, I'll link it to into the, into the description below. Um, but yeah, we have parallel resources for very, very long instruction, Word type architecture, multi-core, multi-processor, uh, viable binary compatibility with x86, uh, program parallelization by optimizing compiler. Um, so this microarchitecture is a compiler optimization architecture. It relies a lot on the compiler to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, if that sounds familiar to you, uh, then you may have heard of Intel's Itanium or Transmeter Crusoe. You know, the, these sorts of architectures that get involved with very long instruction word type designs and binary translation. Yeah, it doesn't set itself up to be a high performance chip to begin with, but the fact that it's very interesting is, is nonetheless. So here we go, binary compatibility. Direct execution of 20 operating systems, including MS-DOS, Windows XP, and Windows 7. You know, all the operating systems that were popular in 2015. Direct execution of a thousand popular applications. Now, I actually found a video on this. Um, what somebody had done with one of the eight core new 8-core processors was run the Blender test of the Ryzen chip rendering that you may remember from uh, late 2016, I think it was, late, maybe late 2017, where AMD showed off uh, that Ryzen render against an Intel chip uh, you know, using you know, something like their Ryzen 7 1800X. And at the time, they got about 35 seconds on those tests. Uh, this chip will do it in 2 minutes 50, uh, just to put it into perspective. But here we go, secure program execution technology, uh, performance 80% from native up to 80%, so 80% is best case. And you don't need an Intel license if you're doing bit translation, uh, Qualcomm has essentially proved that. Um, so this is how the uh, binary translation works. Um, you have binary compilation uh, for the system and for Linux applications. Um, you also have, you know, interpretation layer at, at the operating system. And then we have, you know, compatibility details, several optimization levels. Um, and yeah, if, if, if this is what you're interested in, then this document is quite fun. Security in the Arborus, all pointers are protected by tags. Um, this is obviously before Spectre Meltdown, so don't ask. Uh, Elbrus products. So we had a dual core and a quad core and we're talking sort of 2011 here 2013 using tsm 90 nanometer tsmc 65 nanometer 800 megahertz 45 watts um you know and then you have your know, personal computers for offices essentially built on you know a dual core and a quad core uh and then we get, you know, to the biggest servers. This is, like I say, this is still 2015. So this is when they only had the quad core chip um, at 800 megahertz, 200 uh, gigaflops with four CPUs, 96 gigabytes of DDR3 memory in a 2U. And then, you know, you can go up to a rack and you can get 13.8 teraflops in 20 kilowatts. Of course, you could do that with a top end GPU these days with just one of them. Um, operating system. 
you know, there is a Elbrus OS, which is native, um, but it has binary compatibility for Linux applications that run Intel 86. Um, development kit, operating system package, and the future here is when they were talking about uh, the 8 core. So they were planning, you know, 2016 and then Elbrus 8CV. This is the high 1.5 gigahertz core, which we found about today. Um, the die area is actually only 333 square millimeters, but they are using TSMC's 28 nanometer um, in, you know, 2018. It's now 2020. That's kind of, you know, where we are here. Uh, I would love to get an update of this sort of document. Um, and then we, you know, go into the microarchitecture. So we're dealing with wide commands because it's a VLIW. This is characteristics of the quad core, the eight core, and the eight C V eight C B processor. Um, so we're looking at five hundred and seventy six gigaflops of single precision or two hundred and eighty eight gigaflops of double precision. Um, level one cache of sixty four kilobytes. That's what double the size of uh, modern X eighty six processors. Five hundred and twelve kilobytes of L two cache uh, per core. And then a 16 meg L3 cache, four channels of DDR4 2400, um, yeah, 333 square millimeters, 2.78 billion transition transistors. Note that a mobile CPU on the latest processors will do, you know, um, 110 square millimeters and over 10 billion uh, transistors. Um, and, you know, information about pipelining and then um, all the different. Um, execution ports that go into this chip and then all the different you know port configurations you can do it's got special predicate devices and all this fun this is this is a fun document to go through and then it, you know it does some code comparison so say you want to get hold of one of these boards well so this was posted April 29th uh, this is last week as this is being filmed uh, about, you know, new motherboards are on order, showing one of their 8-core CPUs, two channels of memory. They're doing uh, even new modules based on their single-core stuff, and then, you know, 8-core stuff. Uh, and, you know, this is what the motherboard looks like close up. And you can tell, you know, there's patches for variants. And that's how it's that's how that's done. Um, and then, yeah, we go up to the big uh, quad socket ones for the servers now let's say you want to buy this uh how much is it going to cost well we did a search um and you know the mcst website actually lists all these products and says you know uh click here to view to order um and you know 160,000 rubles is 1700 us dollars for the eight core which is a bit beyond my budget um unfortunately uh, if anybody from um, MCST or one of their partners wants to help us source a chip for analysis, that would be really fun. I would uh, love to know what these guys are planning for the future, whether they're going to go down to a 14 nanometer, whether they're stuck at TSMC, um, or maybe they'd go for Samsung. Global Foundries might not be available, given that that's based in the US. Uh, so after I filmed my video, I, I was directed to this update. Uh, found on the Russian version of Wikipedia. Uh, it looks like Elbrus, there will be a 16 core version of Elbrus um, coming soon from MCST. Um, start of production is planned in 2021. Expected performance is 1.5 teraflops. Um, and it will be a uh, 16 nanometer chip running at 2 gigahertz. Um, running DDR4, PCIe3 says more than 100 watts and estimated about 6 billion transistors. It looks like, yes, there is a significant uh, roadmap. Uh, <laughs> there's a link here to the Elbrus 32 core, uh, which I suspect we might see in you know, 2024, 2025. Uh, then they might start talking about running on 7 nanometer. Um, you know, still says here virtualization hardware support for Intel x86 64 bit. Um, and you know dynamic optimization so this is interesting it's going to be fun um if the start of serial production is planned in 2021 uh you can imagine that the rollout is uh, going to be in 2022 all these interesting processes very fun but again it all comes down to these countries want their own silicon they want to control the silicon stack they want us to control the security 
they want to control the ability to know what's inside they want the software stack they want to be able to you know monitor their citizens to a certain extent and yeah russia's not the only one i've, I've mentioned china there's also the european processor program the only thing that some of these countries need to do as well is build the fabs in order to create the chips now the critical element there is that when you get to a high enough uh, or more advanced process node your limiting factor is your ability to secure asml equipment uh, for lithography um, asml is split between netherlands and the us and they come under the thumb of when they you know sell their eev machines so that's the elbrus cpu uh, new microarchitecture uh, document and programming optimization document uh, it's great to see this stuff online if you're involved with this please put more of this stuff online um, apparently now I'm a source on Wikipedia for this information when all I did was take it from other places um, what do you think about these uh, countries building their own silicon um, are you interested are you worried because they're not audited in the same way that perhaps x86 and ARM CPUs are uh, let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe and there's a bell here if you want the latest videos from Tech Tech Potato. What's your minimum specification?